when you get a certain age, you get to the point where it's good to be anywhere. I'll tell you what, I'm done with weddings. Man, those weddings, and they got to go to Natchitoches and have all that river pretty sights and all that stuff. And Oh, my Lord. Those 1 o'clock in the morning weddings just get old quick, amen? I'm too old for that. Load all those stuff up and haul everything back and... You look at the clock and it's, it says one o'clock and you're going, oh my God, I got to get up in a little while, amen? It's good to know that we can serve a real God. Amen. It's good to know that we have a God that's alive and well. Amen. It's good to know that when we call upon his name, he's always there. Amen. It's good to know as much as an earthly father loves his children, how much more that our father love us, amen. loves amen. us a lot. I'm going to try my best this morning, always on Father's Day, obviously. We always try to prepare a message, and of course it's about fathers, but believe me, the application could be for you two moms and you two young men and women and all that's in the room, so don't just think that I'm talking strictly to the fathers. If I use their name a lot, it's because I'm trying to get their attention, but it's okay, amen? amen. <clears throat> I, um, I want you to understand, and I've said this before, that... As an earthly father, we are somewhat the first example of what the heavenly father is all about. Amen. Now, some say, I don't understand, what are you talking about? Well, for me, and I share this because it's my testimony, and I got the mic, amen? <laughs> but for me, whenever I read after getting saved about the love of the father, it wasn't hard for me to get that. Because many know I, I love my dad and my dad loves me. And, and he always said, I love you, son. I love you, son. Now, for him, if he heard his father say, I love you one time, that was one too many or whatever. You know I mean? It's just he just didn't get it. And so maybe you're here today and maybe for whatever reason there was a bad relationship between you and your father. And maybe your father just didn't know Jesus. And maybe your father was a bad father. And, and truly, from the bottom of my heart, I'm sorry for that. And I know it makes it difficult because many times when you start singing about the Father and start worshiping the Father, you can't help but think about your earthly father. And so that being said, you know, it's so important that men of God stand up and be the right father they're supposed to be. Now, I read a statistic, and forgive me for not knowing exactly all the numbers, but I'm going to try my best to talk about it just for a second so you get this point. But one of the statistics I read several years ago talked about the statistic was talking about, across the board, about children returning back to their faith, returning back to the church after they grow up and they leave the house. And it was talking about how raising kids in church and, and maybe, maybe you as a parent are in church and for whatever reason you're not really sold out, you go because it's the thing to do or you go because it's church and you go, you're not really sold out, you just kind of go, kind of more of a social event than anything else. The chances of your children returning back to their faith was in single digits. I mean, it was very low, very, very low, which is a scary thought. But really what was surprising was it talked about how the mother being sold out and the father not really being sold out, but the mother being sold out, it rose. It began to rise a little bit, and it rose up somewhere in the 20s, maybe early 30%. And then what's really interesting was it talked about how the father and the mother both were sold out. Now, these are two parents that love the Lord. They're sold out to God. And it rose again to like 36%. But this was the shocking part. The shocking part was it talked about, now this does not by no means gives mothers excuses not to do anything. But by shocking, it just said mothers who were not sold out but the father who was totally sold out, totally surrendered in church, mother not, just kind of halfway there, the statistics rose again. Now, that don't make any sense, does it? Because you would think if the mother and father both are sold out, the statistics would be higher. But when they saw the father sold out, something about the father, it began to rise in statistics. Now, I thought that was really interesting. And I realized that even today, even <laughs> she can get away with that, amen? Even today, every sitcom you see on TV, they're going to have some kind of situation where the father's made, made fun of, 
You know, they, the father's an idiot. You know, and here's the reality of this. If the world can destroy the fathers, then it gets to the children. And it begins to really demoralize and really spiritual value-wise begins to push the standards of our country down so far until we can't even see up. Now, if you're here today and you're a single parent, a single mother, raising your children, listen, you got hope too because Timothy was raised by his mother. It really didn't talk much about the father because you talk about the mother Lois and the grandmother Eunice and all this, which that had to be Cajun, amen? amen. But amen. they were raised... You know, and Timothy turned out to be pretty good. So you have hope too. So don't leave here thinking, well, I have no hope. I'm a single parent or whatever. That's not the case at all. But the point I'm trying to bring out today is simply this. Us fathers need to stand up and take our position. Amen. As fathers, we need to know who we are in Christ. And when we know who we are in Christ, and guess what? Our kids will know who they are in Christ. Now, what I want to do, and, and I kind of put this up here, and I normally would give the kids, I would give the kids the opportunity to, to pick it up and bring it to their their, their you know, mothers or fathers, we're giving away gifts today. But some of the gifts I'm giving away today are pocket knives. Kind of cool, amen? amen? I want all the fathers to make sure they get a pocket knife. So after the service, we're going to ask you to come up here and get a pocket knife. There's small ones, big ones, large ones, all different sizes. And so I've done that because I want to talk about this morning, as a father, a father is a protector. Amen. Now, I know some of these knives are really small. If you've got to defend your whole family on a little pocket knife, you're in trouble, Amen. <laughs> But I thought it would symbolize that for us. And so, as a father, we need to be protectors of our home. Amen? Amen. We need to be the ones that's really going to watch out for our home. Because that's what really God called us to do. Amen. Again, please don't throw rocks at me. Don't say, well, I'm doing a good job. I'm a single parent. I'm a... I, I hope you are. But I'm trying to get you to understand as a father. We're talking about dads today. Okay? How we need to step up and play the role as a protector. Now, as I studied the scriptures, and as I began to think about this, I thought about a father. And this guy's name was Jairus. Now, I want you to understand this passage of scripture and is read in different parts of the gospel, but I'm going to pull it out of Mark, okay? In the book of Mark, chapter 5, we find this guy by the name of Jairus. And Jairus was a ruler. He was a man of authority. He was a man who was well-liked. All the things you want to know about a man, he was a man's man. This guy had a daughter who was 12 years old who was sick at the house. Now, remember, now, Jesus goes through the situation. He, he, he's healing the sick. He's doing all this stuff. He goes to the other side. He gets in a storm. The disciples wake him up, you know. And so Jesus is going through all this kind of stuff. He comes back now to this side, and Jairus meets him and says to him, Jesus, I understand your authority. I understand your power. I understand your anointing. If you come to my house, I know without a doubt my daughter will be okay. So Jesus decides to go. And so... A lot of things take place here. Now, Jesus is traveling. As he's traveling back, all of a sudden, this woman shows up with the issue of blood. And we know the story, how she presses in and she touches the hem of his garment and she was healed. Okay? And Jesus speaks to her and says, hey, woman, you know, your faith who touched me and we know all the story. Now, I love that, that part in the King James how it talks about the issue of blood because I believe issue and blood represents us in life. We have issues in life sometimes. And so this woman had issues in life. She sold all that she had. I mean, she's seen every doctor she could. She was broke. I mean, all the stuff she did. And finally, Jesus comes along and heals her. But think about this for a second. Now, Jairus is walking with Jesus. He's got on his mind the fact that his daughter is sick back at the house. Now, understand, Jairus was a man of authority, okay? He was a man of position. He could have sent somebody else to go get Jesus, but a real man go gets him himself. Come on, somebody. He understood that, you know what, my daughter's sick at the house and I could command somebody to go get Jesus, but this is too important for me to send somebody else. I'm going myself. And so he goes himself. And so he is, he's along the way, and all of a sudden now this woman comes along. This woman obviously was broke as Potan's duck. She didn't have nothing. And all of a sudden she's pressing in, and now she's got Jesus' attention. Hello, somebody. Jairus could have been, you know, mad about it or upset about it, but he didn't get upset about it. So he's there, and all of a sudden now he's thinking, well, come on, Jesus, I know this woman needs this, but i got a daughter over here. Can you get over here? Now, a lot of things took place because Jairus, obviously, even to come out in public to say, Jesus, come to my house, he was going to be ridiculed because there were a lot of people in the synagogue and a lot of rulers in the synagogue that wanted to kill Jesus. Yeah, Amen? Amen? Amen. So he had to take a position and say, you know what, I'm going to get him to heal, not kill. Yeah. 
And so now he goes, and all of a sudden now he's, he's spending time with this girl, and all of a sudden now she's healed, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, somebody walks up and says, Hey, your daughter's dead. Now, in his mind, he's thinking, Well, Jesus, if you wouldn't have wasted all this time, I don't know. If you just came when you were supposed to, don't, don't bother the master, they said. Your daughter's dead. But Jesus says, you know what? She ain't dead. She's just asleep. Yeah, come on now. Come on, come on, and he says this to him, and this is some of the places I want to pick up, some of the parts here. We find this over, jump down into Mark 5.35. While he was still speaking, some come for the rule of the synagogue house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the, the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. Now, here's the real father, amen? He knows that the father has all this concern about the daughter who just died. Now he's saying, listen, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. He's trying to get him to be comforted on the fact that everything's going to be all right, just believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, and the brother of James. And he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw all the turmoil, and all the weeping, and all the wailing, and all the stuff taking place. you got to remember now, during this time, a lot of countries, if somebody was dead and they had to be notified, three different people had to say, this person is dead, this person is dead. Three people had to come in and recognize this person to be dead. So there was three different people who came in and saw this daughter that was dead. And what they do at this point is they call for the professional mourners. Okay? So now the professional mourners are there. And I don't know if you've ever been in a place where the professional mourners are at. They wail and, oh, my, oh, my Lord, oh, bring her back, bring her back, bring her back. Kind of like my wife, she said, she, she wants our kids. If something ever happened to her, they won't have mourned. They won't, oh, mama, don't go. Please don't go, mama. Come on back, mama. I love you, mama. <laughs> and so these are all professional mourners, amen? <laughs> I ain't lying. <laughs> she wants to pull in the casket back. No, mama, don't go, don't go, don't go. Y'all <laughs> And so all these professional mourners are crying out and all this stuff is taking place. And all of a sudden now he walks up and he takes only Peter and, and his other disciples with him. Can I tell you, when you're in a crisis situation, you want the right people around you. Amen. 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 When you're in a situation like this, Jesus knew who he wanted to put around him. And he says, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead but sleeping. What happened there? Yes, they begin to ridicule him. Yes. And they ridiculed him, but when he put them all outside... He took the father and the mother and the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Now, let me stop there for a second. I said this is a man of authority, okay? This is a man of position. Now, let me tell you what a real man knows. A real man knows his place. Now, this is his home. And Jesus goes to his home, and all of a sudden, Jesus is like, you get out of here, you get out of here, you get out of here, you come in, and we're going in together. Now, Jairus could have said, hey, wait a minute, buddy. This is my house. You ain't doing that. This is my place. But you know what? When we understand a real father and the love of a real father and the protective of a real father, a real father releases his home to the one who built the home. Come on, somebody. He understands his position. And so he takes a step back and he's like, Jesus, you're Lord of my house. See, we want to make him Lord of our houses, but we don't want to release our houses. I shocked my wife one time and shocked the church one time. I went on a mission trip and came back and stood in the pulpit. And first thing I said was, as your pastor, I'll resign this church. And my wife's like, oh, you didn't talk to me about that. What's up with that? But the point I was trying to make was, you know what? I resign it because I don't want to pastor it. I want God to pastor it. I want to release this thing to God because I can't do it by myself. And see, a real man understands, you know what? This might be my house that I built with the bricks and I built with the wood and the mortar and all these kind of things. But you're going to be Lord of my house. And release God in this house. And all of a sudden we walk in and this is what we find. He goes in, he enters in the house, the child was laying. He took the child by the hand and he said to her, Tamada Kamude, which means translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. In other words, get up, girl. And immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years old. And they were all overcome with great amazement. Now, I love this because you remember now, you had three different people had to recognize this girl was dead. Okay? Now, here's the miracle. The miracle comes in. He heals this little girl. And now they can really say it's a miracle because three people came in and said, she's dead. But he commanded them strictly that no one should know it. Now, that always bothers me. But, I mean, that's God's thing, and that's another story. And he wanted to do some things privately, but he said this. And he said to them, some, give her something to eat. Now, one thing I find here is you've got to understand something really took place. This girl was sick, and she died. He came back. Not only did he raise her from the dead, but he healed her. 
And all of a sudden now he's trying to get us to use common sense. He says, feed her. Hello, somebody. You see, sometimes we can be so super spiritual till we know earthly good. Because he's saying, hey, look, I know she was dead, and I know that she's alive now, but guess what? She's still human. Give her some food. Amen. Sometimes we just need to get on the practical side. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we can be so all oh, this and all that until we miss all the practical side. Amen. Can I tell you, common sense is not real common. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Now, I want to I wanna kind of go over a few things that I think is kind of important. And one of the things that's important is talking about being the protector. As a protector of our home, as a father, as a protector of our home, the first thing you have to be is a provider. Now, when we think about provider, we think about bringing the check home to mama. We think about, you know, make sure the kids have shoes for school. And those are all important things. But there's more than that. There's more than that. See, you need to provide spiritually. You need to provide emotionally. You need to provide when your little girl comes home and some little boy, you know, said something ugly about her hair and you're going to comfort her. You, you see what I'm saying? As a father, we need to provide. Now, one of the things I understand the scripture talks about, and over in the King James, it reads in Timothy, it talks about a man that don't provide for his family is lower than an infidel. Now, that always gives me a really weird feeling because an infidel is a non-believer. Now, this is a strong statement here because he's saying, listen, a man that's not willing to provide for his family is not even a believer. Are you a believer this morning? Amen. Are you providing for your home today? Amen. And again, I, you know, for me, I went through this. I remember, you know, working hard and I, you know, I made good money and I, my kids had the best clothes. They went to the best school at that time early on and all these things were taking place. And all of a sudden, God just woke me up one day and said, listen, a father is more than just bringing home a paycheck. A provider is more than just providing a paycheck. Because I found myself getting up in the morning, leaving before they were awake and coming home when they were in bed. Now, I know that this is going to sound funny, and some of you think it might be strange, but I remember listening to the song, The Cat's in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon. <laughs> Little Boy Blue and the Man in the Moon. When you're coming home, Dad, I don't know when, but we'll get together then. Now, your pastor was a big old baby. <laughs> no, no, they're going to leave. <laughs> Why? Because, you know what? I realize <laughs> I cry like a big old baby, amen? But you know what? we got to wake up and realize that, you know what? Don't wait till it's too late. You know, my dad who loved me and I talked about his love and I talked about those things, I remember something, and, and to this day, I just, it, when I close my eyes and, and begin to imagine and I can see it, but my father, his business took him outside the house, so he was gone a lot. He traveled a lot, but he still loved He'd come home, I love you, and he was a good dad, but he just traveled a lot. And I remember, for whatever reason, my dad was raised on a houseboat and down in, uh, by Youth Plaquemine, and so he didn't get the chance to graduate from, from the Green Devils, Plaquemine High, from high school. He went to the Air Force, and when he was in the Air Force, he got his GED, and he graduated that away. And so... I knew someone who worked in a jewelry store, and so I went back and I found a, a ring that would have been at the same time my dad would have graduated. It was, a, it was a high school ring, and I bought it for him, and I had it wrapped, and I had it prepared, and I, I remember giving it to him, and I gave him this graduation ring that represented the time he would have graduated from high school, and when I did, now remember, I'm down, I'm out of, I'm out of school, I think in my second year of, of, of um, Isometrics, and so I'm, I'm right around that time. I'm probably around 20 years old, and I give him this ring, and all of a sudden I looked up, and my dad got the box, got the ring, and he looked at me, and without saying one word, I knew what he was thinking. He looked at me, and he he thought, "Where'd all the time go? Where have I been? This was my little boy that used to jump on the porch into my arms, and now he's giving me a ring. Where where where'd the time go?" And I remember just for a moment, just I could see this kind of like a, 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 a face of regret, like, you know. And, and for me, I didn't want that to happen because it's important that we provide, but it's important that we provide more than just money. It's our, we've got to provide our lives, ourselves, our time. Amen? Are you, you, you getting this? This is good stuff? Let's keep going here. One of the areas I'm talking about being a, a provider and a protector for the home is a father has to have the home ready and prepared. 
Now, we know the scripture says be ready in season and out of season. But there's another scripture when it talks about how the, the, when the master comes, how the, the, the real man of the house prepares the house. He said if he'd have known the thief was coming, yeah, on, then he would have been ready for the thief before he got there. Yeah, on, so a real father prepares the home. Now, this is what the scripture says. Let me read some of this to you. It talks about the second watch, and it goes on saying, jump down in uh, 12, Luke 12, verse 40. And therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at the hour you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak the parable only to us, to all the people? And the Lord said, who then that is faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give him portion of, of food in due season? Blessed is that steward whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Amen? Amen. Now, what he's saying there basically is, is blesses the man who has everything ready. So when he, he, you know, sometimes we get to the point we don't expect it. If we expect it, we, we'll be ready for it. Amen. But can I tell you something? Nobody knows when the master's coming back. Amen. And nobody knows the day and the hour that you're going to breathe your last, last breath. Amen. Amen? I wish I could tell you that. I wish I could tell you I knew exactly when the Lord's coming back. No one knows. Amen? But you know what? A good father, as a protector and a provider, is preparing his home for that day to come, Amen. whenever that day may be. Again, it might be tomorrow, it might be 10 years, it might be whatever it is. But see, a real father don't wait till all of a sudden it happens and then tries to go back to the store. It's like being in a storm. You know, if, if you're in the middle of a hurricane, if the hurricane's coming and the hurricane's almost here in Leesville, can I tell you something? You're not going to find a flashlight at Walmart. You can forget it. You're not going to find any water at Walmart. You're not going to find a generator. You're not going to find these things. You should have had these things before the storm came. Because if you had them before the storm came, when the storm comes, you're prepared. You're ready. You've got everything ready to go for the family. See, a real protector has everything prepared for his home. He prepares his children for marriage. He prepares his daughters for marriage. Come on, somebody. I told my granddaughter the other day, I, I, I was bringing her to the doctor, and we had a little trip that we take every week to this little doctor she was going to and i said papa's going to teach you how a real man's supposed to treat a lady i said don't you dare go out unless they open the door for you and i'd open the door for her and i'd let her in my truck now she's 10 years old guess what i'm training her Amen. so when some Amen. comes along Amen. i was processing there i was trying to get in there. when that guy comes along She's going to recognize and know, you know what, he's not the one. Come on, somebody. Why? Because you prepare them. You get them ready. You know, one of the things I did when I was in business, and my wife was homeschooling, but when I was in business, I'd have clients come from out of town, and they always want to take me to lunch or whatever. And so what I would do, one at a time, I would take one of my boys on a business lunch. Why would you do that? Because I wanted them to understand what it was to sit at a table and know how to act at a business lunch, how to order their food, how to carry on a conversation. Why? Because I wanted to prepare them one day. They don't just wake up in the world and go, oh, Pastor Taters, Pastor Meat, come on, Jesus, let's eat. Amen. You know you, you what I'm saying? A real father prepares. He's doing all these things. He's making ready. He's making way for his children, for the world. Amen? Amen. Amen. Here's the next thing. A real father understands that is, his steps are ordered by God. Amen. Now, let me just go back for this, okay? Let me read this to you. Psalms 37. It says, The wicked borrow and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man, the steps of a righteous man, are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. He says, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken or descendants begging bread. He is ever merciful and lends, and his descendants are blessed. The steps of a good man are ordered by God. Now, why, why did you say this, Pastor? Well, I'm fixing to hit some of you between the eyes. So, hide the knives, amen. <laughs> you can't have the knives, so I'll leave, <laughs> When you come to Fort Polk and you get this attitude, it's the armpit of hell. It's so hot. I wish I had Virginia. I wish I had Kentucky. I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. It. What you're saying is where God has you is not right. 
Because, see, a real man understands that the feet of a righteous man is ordered by God. See, a real man steps back and says, you know what, honey? We might have put in for Virginia, but we got Fort Cup Hope. God has a reason for us there. And then when we understand that the, the, the feet of a, the, the righteous man is ordered by God, then we don't whine and complain about where God has us. You see, if you're not careful, you will spend all your time anywhere you go fussing and complaining and whining about where you at instead of saying, God, thank you. Because, God, I acknowledge you, and I believe if I acknowledge you, you'll direct my path. God, you said the feet of a righteous man is ordered by you. And then when you understand that, then you have to say, God, there's a great reason for us being here today instead of whining about it. As a protector, you treat your kids that way. You train your kids that way. How would you like to spend the rest of your life just whining about wishing you were somewhere else? Huh? How many times have you heard people like that? How many, how many you work with people like that, you know? They just constantly, man, uh, I hate this place, man. I wish I was somewhere else. Yeah. I was in the doctor's office, and this girl came, and she was talking about where she was from, and I won't use the state because I'm sure some of you are from there, and that's okay. It's probably a nice state, but this girl just got on my last nerves, and she was talking about, yeah, my state this, my state that, nah. and finally I looked at her. She was working, making our money, you know. <laughs> And I just looked at her and I said, why don't you go back to your state? Amen. She looked at me and like, what, what, what? I said, I didn't study. You can see all the other girls behind the counter. <laughs> they were giggling because they probably got tired of hearing it too, Amen. you know. Thank you, Lord, for ordering our steps. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for, for allowing me to say, God, wherever you have me, I'm going to find the, the best out of it. God, there's something good there. I allow God to order my steps to a little town called Mamu when my grandmother died. And I found my beautiful bride in Mamu, Louisiana. At a funeral home. Boy, that's tough, amen. amen. I can see now, everybody will be looking in the paper. When's the next funeral? Let's go check this place out, man. Let's go check them out. Man, Pastor can find one at the funeral home. Maybe they got some more over there, amen. Let's go look. Just don't mingle with the dead ones, amen? <laughs> Here we go. Here's the next thing. A real father becomes a protector when he teaches his kids to trust also. Because, see, sometimes we talk about it, but we really don't trust. Now, the Scripture says here in Psalms 37.1, it says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and withered as a green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth the righteousness as the light and the justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Now, why is this important? Because, listen, we need to trust, again, going back to our steps, we need to trust God's got everything under control. Amen. And when we teach our children, the Bible says that we delight ourselves in the Lord, He gives us the desires of our heart. Amen. And when we learn to trust Him, our kids learn to trust Him at an early age. Amen. But if you don't trust Him, how can you train your kids to trust Him? And when we trust him, and, and one of the things I like about the scriptures is do not fret because of evildoers. Now, what I love about that is, you know what? When your kids see you working hard and, 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 and going to work every day and being a man of integrity, walking, walking the rope, doing the right things, and all of a sudden your neighbor who you know is stealing from the government, who, who's cheating on his wife, who's doing all these other things, they're driving a better car than you. Now, guess what? When you trust in God, you don't fret on what he has. Because you're trusting, guess what? You're training your kids something he can't train his kids. I tell this story, and, and I love it because it, it just it ministers to me so much. When Judy and I went on a trip years ago. Kyle was just a teenager, and, and Kobe and Caleb was off in college. And we were on a cruise, and at the last day of the cruise, I got my ticket, and my ticket said, 
They didn't charge me for something I bought. And so I saw the lady who booked the cruise with us. She happened to be on the cruise too. And she was supposed to have been a Christian. And I saw her and I said, listen, they didn't, they didn't charge me for something I bought. And she said, oh, just consider that a blessing. I said, oh, no, you're not Mr. Carnival. <laughs> you know, you can't give me that, you know. And so I talked to my wife, and I'm looking at the ticket, and I'm looking at the line, and I'm looking at the ticket. And to get off a cruise, you've never been on a cruise, to, to disembark, it's, it's a process, you know. It's a long process to get off of that thing. And to go down there and to pay for this thing, it was a long line to go in. And I kept looking at her and saying, man, i got to get this straight, blah, blah, blah. And finally I said, baby, let's stay here with the boys. I'm going to go get this straight. And as I'm walking down the staircase, it was a, it was a long spiral staircase, Kyle was on one side and Kobe's on the other side, and they're talking to each other, and they don't know that I can hear them because of the, the echo of the staircase. But Kyle says to Kobe, there goes Dad, always walking in integrity. And I tell you what, that ministered to me. Because you know what? You don't ever know when your kids are watching you. And there he is talking to his brother going, you know what? We might be late getting off the boat. Guess what? Dad's going to walk in integrity. And see, that's a legacy to leave. When your kids know that no matter what happens, no matter what it takes, you're going to do what's right because it's right. See, that's what real men do. They trust. They protect their families in that aspect. Here's the next thing. We're talking about protecting our children. Another thing we do, we protect our kids when we lead by example. Now, you've heard me talk about this before, okay? One of the things I like when Matthew, when Jesus tells him, says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Obviously, he was doing something right for them to pack up and leave and go with him, right? Amen? Amen? He was a great example of a leader. Also, there's other places, and he talks about in Timothy, he's talking about ministry here, and he says, let no one despise your youth, but be a good example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. When? Till I come. Give attention to reading, exaltation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by the prophecy of the laying on the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them, that your process may be evident to all. Take heed to yourselves and to the doctrine. Continue in them. In doing this, in doing this, in doing this, by being this example, you will save both yourself and those who hear you and those who watch you and those you are raising. Lead by example. Amen? Lead by example. Do it because it's right to do it. Let your kids see you do it because it's right. Don't listen. I thank God for, for caller ID. Amen? Why? Because some of you don't have your kids lying anymore for you. Amen? You can see the call ID and say, I don't want to answer. You don't pick it up. Right. Instead of saying, tell, you, tell them I'm not here. Tell them I'm not here. Come on, somebody. Y'all old enough. Some of you don't remember not having call a caller ID. <laughs> you know, to keep from lying, someone just go outside. Tell them I'm, I'm outside. You stand outside the door. <laughs> just keep from lying. Amen. <laughs> I mean, it was all kind of tricks, you know. I had a pastor friend of mine. He loved the fish more than he liked to do anything else. And so he bought him a bass boat. And he named the, the bass boat Visitation. And so somebody would say, where's the pastor? And they would say, he's out on visitation. <laughs> so I named my tractor, visitation. Amen. Where's the pastor? He's out on visitation, digging another hole. Lead my example. Again, the example that we lead with are ones that they must follow. And, and, and I close my eyes, and I'm not throwing rocks at you for this, but I'm just telling you, don't... The only example I can use in this area, and some of you might do it, and that, that, I, I, that's your habit. But if you're a smoker, don't blow smoke in your kid's face and tell them not to smoke. Because I promise you, they're going to steal you a pack of cigarettes. Because, see, we can sit there all day long and say, don't do as I do, do as I say do. That's crazy, man. That's crazy. How in the world can you tell somebody not to do something you're doing yourself? Amen? Amen. Now, I know I might have stepped on a few toes there, but there's more than just that. There's all kinds of things. You can tell your kids don't do this and you do that. You need to make sure that you lead by example and do it because it's right. Amen? Here's the next thing. A real father brings complete comfort to his home. It says, 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be complete. Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of the love and peace will be with you. Now, I put that down there because, you know, as a father, we need to, when we come home, we need to bring peace to the house instead of chaos. You know, there are some, and I, and I hate to say this, but there are probably some mothers and children like when their, their husbands are gone because when he's there, it's just chaotic. Amen? 
Instead of bringing peace to the home, bringing... Listen, I know my dad couldn't hold the walls down if a storm was coming. But guess what? When he was home, there was peace in the home. There was comfort in the home. Amen? And so a real father brings comfort to his home, brings peace to his home. You know... If you go into the house, Dad, and, 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 and the kids are fighting, there's chaos, man, learn to walk in there with just such an authority of peace. And walk in and say, you know what, guys, let's put this all away. Dad's home. Let's talk about it. What, you, you get where I'm going. You know, just be that one that's going to walk in and lead your kids in the comfort and hope and the peace of the home. And here's the last one. And, and before I say it, I'm going to kind of prepare it a little bit. But... Um, my dad, I love dearly, and you know that. I talk about him quite often. And now that he's, he's not doing so well, he lives down in South Louisiana with my sister, um, it's hard for me to get down there because it's a, it's a, it's a day's journey. You know, by the time you go down there and come back, it's a day. And sometimes just finding one day to get down there and back is difficult. You know, life goes on, I'm busy and everything. And so I told the wife, all these things I got going on, I said, Friday morning I'm going to get up real early and I'm going to take off and I'm going to go down there and spend the day with my dad. And so I did. I got up real early. And I took off to go spend the day with my dad. Now, let me say this, and I said this earlier today. I left real early, and uh, has anybody ever had one of those little five-hour energy energy? Can I tell you, don't do them. I stopped at a little station right before I got on uh, Interstate 49 because I was kind of a little sleepy. It was early, and, and I told the little guy behind the counter, I said, you ever try one of these? Like, yep, yep, try it. I thought you might have already got one now, you know. Yep, right there, try it. He's the only one. He's had like two or three of them, you know. He said, the grape one's good. The grape one's good. The grape one's good. I'm like, all right, Shelton. You know? And so he says, try this. He said, but just kill it. Just drink it fast. And so I said, okay. It was nasty, man. I drank it real fast. Got in the car. I'm driving down the road. Fifteen minutes down the road, I'm like, whoa. I mean, I was wired for sound, man. I was like, can I get out and run around? I was pulling my truck. You, know? you get wired up, man. But I'm traveling to go see Dad, and I'm spending the day with him and just loving on him and just having a good day. But I, I'm, I'm praying about today, and I'm praying about my time with my father, and I'm praying about my kids, and I'm praying about the service. And I'm listening to some tapes, and I'm listening to different things. And I was listening to this book I just bought with T.D. Jakes, and I'm listening to some things he was saying. And, and, and as I'm listening to him, he said something, and it was not, nothing contained to, to this, but when he said it, it brought me to this. So that being said, I was thinking about the story, and many of us read it many times. We all know the story of the master goes to the one he trusts, and he gives him five talents. And he says, he gave him the one he trusted five, another one he trusted, he gave him two, another one he trusted, he gave one. And when the master returned, he went to the one who had the five, and he done real well with them. He multiplied them twice he had 10 well done my faithful servant you know i'll make you rule over many things blah 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 and we know the story how he says all these great things about it also the one with two says the same thing you know i gave you two you multiplied you did good proud of you good servant my faithful servant we know the story but the last one he says to him he says you wicked lazy no good for nothing servant and he takes away what he gave him. And he even said, why didn't you even just, he, he buried it. Why didn't you at least put it in the bank and get some interest off of it? Amen. And he really gives him a hard time. And he goes on to say, you know, he's going to put you in a place where, you know, grasping of wickedness, all this, all this stuff. He says all these things about the wickedness servant. <clears throat> and as I'm reading that, and I'm thinking about, talents and, and, and it's used as a value and it's used as a value of this time and this era and it's, it's money and but of course you know we use talents and we talk about the talents of individuals one can sing one can dance different talents and stuff but then I started thinking about how the scripture says and I'm going to read this and I'm going to tell you what I mean by it <clears throat> but the scripture over in Psalms says Psalms 127.3 Behold Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of their womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with the enemies at the gate. 
And he talks about the inheritance of a child, and, and really inheritance is really things that he's passed down from birth. I mean, you could pass your characteristics down. You can pass the way you, you cut your meat. You could pass the way you say a joke. I mean, you, you, all these characteristics you could pass down to your children. And when he talked about the talents, and he says five, five, two, two, one, he took away from him. Just for a moment, let's just imagine those talents as, as our children, you know, and he entrusts us with five are we multiplying our talents? Are we doing everything we can for our kids, with our kids, so their life will be multiplied instead of being taken away? Because, see, we could put value on money. We could put value on stocks. We could put value on houses. But how much more valuable is our children? And how much more value is the gift that each one of our children have? How much value is the gift that you give them that they should have? Pastor Adam, who passed away some time ago, dear friend of mine, loved him to death. One day he said to me, he says, where do you think the most, wealth, what do you think the most wealthiest land in, in all the world, the, the most wealthiest land, the most land with most value? And of course, I started thinking about, well, maybe, you know, Africa because of the, you know, the gold or maybe, you know, Russia because of diamonds or this, this. And I started naming off all these valuable minerals. And he said to me, he said, the most valuable place of real estate is a graveyard and I said what he said just imagine all those gifts that are buried in that graveyard all those gifts that could have been used for the kingdom of God are buried in that graveyard all those wasted gifts that wasn't utilized are buried in that graveyard and I thought God help us God if you entrust me with the talents if you entrust me with kids whether they be biological, spiritual, God, I want to multiply their talents. God, I want to make sure that they, I give them everything they need to do better instead of having it taken away. God, give me wisdom to multiply the talents you entrust me with. Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this word. I pray blessings. God, I just pray right now for every man, woman, and child and Cross this sanctuary. God, if there's someone here today, for whatever reason, maybe something was said. God, it could have been something to do with the men or something to do with, with any part of this message. But God, you spoke to their heart in, much, in somewhat of a profound way. And so I'm speaking to the hearts of everyone, not just to the men. But maybe you're, you're here today, and maybe for whatever reason, some of these things we talked about being a protector. Some of these areas you're struggling in. You're having a hard time in. You're having a hard time with being that person that you should be, that example, that, that leader, all the things that you, you're struggling in a certain area of your life. Don't know, need to know what it is. Don't want to know what it is. All I want you to know is I want to come in agreement. I want to pray with you. So if you're here this morning, something that was said, whether husband or wife, again, it doesn't matter, but something that was said really touched your heart, and you say, Pastor, that's an area that I need prayer in. Would you pray for me in this area? Whatever it may be, I want to pray for you. If that's you this morning, right where you're at, just slip up your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anyone else? Just want to pray for you. See those hands. Anyone else? Just want to pray for you. Anyone else? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you this morning for lives who want to be protectors, for fathers and mothers who want good things for their children. God, let us lead by example. God, let us be all that you call us to be. And God, each hand that was raised for different reasons, God, whatever that hand was raised for, God, whatever you minister to them through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, begin to show them, begin to direct them, begin to guide them. Whatever they need, God, you will provide. And Father, I thank you for that. Now, heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're here this morning. And maybe you might say, Pastor, I've never accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. Or maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, there's a time I was serving the Lord. I'm just backslidden. Well, let's get that right, too. Right there between you and God from the heart. Just pray this simple prayer. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I repent of all my wrongdoings. Jesus, I repent of all the things I've done. Jesus, come into my life today. Jesus, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I want to make you mine. I want my house to be your house, my home to be your home. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Now, you might have prayed that prayer for the first time. Or again, it might be a prayer of rededication. Again, I'm not going to embarrass you. Call you out. I just want to pray for you. 
If you prayed that prayer this morning, right where you're at, just slip up your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. I see those hands. Anyone else? Thank you, Lord. Anyone else? Father, I thank you so much that we can call on the name Jesus and you never deny us. God, you even said, I've seen the righteous forsaken or seen, never seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. God, thank you for your righteousness and thank you for the righteousness of Jesus in this house. Blessings be upon every man, woman, and child that's prayed this prayer. Blessings be upon everyone who stands in need of something in their life. But God, I thank you for this day. Speak to our hearts. Let this day be a great day in the kingdom of God. Blessings be upon them. In Jesus' powerful, holy name, amen and amen. amen. If you receive that word, let's give God a hand. Amen.